item on the agenda, presentations, discussion. We have our legislative delegation <coughs> with us this evening. Uh -huh. All right, go ahead and beat that one. Yeah, try to beat that. Yeah, we that. can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll smash the TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should have let you drive, Jeff. <laughs> choice <laughs> uh, I'm not sure which one uh, Jeff I guess you're gonna sure. lead. I will hit it off and uh, first of all let me say what a pleasure it is to be back here uh, once again uh, to talk to you about uh, what we've done in this legislative session and to answer any questions or get any ideas that uh, you might have uh, for the future I'll, I'll try to be brief I have uh, quite a few pages here of notes but I will let you know that most of the topics that uh, I'll be talking about tonight are fully flushed out and you can read more than you would ever want to read uh, if you just go to my website. Uh, there are posts on every single topic that are here that goes into uh, a lot of detail. But let me start off with the uh, fiscal year 25 budget. Uh, we enacted a $58 billion budget for the year, and uh, it maintains fiscal responsibility while delivering historic levels of investment in every level of education, transportation, regional equity, workforce development, and health care, uh, reflecting the legislature's ongoing commitment to delivering on affordability for residents and economic competitiveness in Massachusetts. And the budget uh, did include a number of items uh, that uh, were spearheaded by your legislative de delegation. And uh, I will highlight, oh boy, I was just talking to you, uh, Senator Roush about font sizes. <laughs> I can still read smaller font than he can. Yes, he can. <laughs> so uh, happy to report, uh, as you know, Franklin's a, um, a hold harmless community, so you get uh, the minimum amount uh, in increases, but we, uh, instead of a $30 per pupil expenditure, it was over $100 uh, per student. So you're going to get $29,717,993 in Chapter 70 funding. You're going to get $2,983,453 in unrestricted general aid. Uh, the Franklin Performing Arts company is in for $100,000, and you, as you may know, that group uh, really did a lot during COVID uh, to keep this community alive, and uh, they lost a lot of money in the process, and this is the, the state's way to help out uh, with those losses and uh, keep them alive, because it's, I think, uh, if you go back to the master plan uh, that we did in 2013, uh, having a performance venue in downtown was central to uh, the revitalization, and I think they have done a magnificent job of doing that. There's also $50,000 in there for the SAFE Coalition uh, to help with substance use disorder. This is, uh, this is the sixth time it's been in there, so uh, they're at about 300, and, uh, actually the seventh time, $350,000 the state has uh, given to that organization. The Franklin Food Pantry uh, continuing to work on their project and delivering this $50,000 in there for the Franklin Food Pantry, $25,000 uh, to the Franklin Downtown Partnership uh, to encourage uh, economic development. And one of the initiatives that uh, uh, I have been very active with and particularly with uh, Senator Rausch is uh, genocide education in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and I'm happy to report uh, that this year's budget has three million dollars set aside for gen awesome. genocide education in Massachusetts. The Franklin Public Schools do take uh, advantage of that grant funding and I hope uh, that they will continue to do so. Also happy to report uh, that the governor signed into law an act to prevent abuse and exploitation which seeks to prevent abuse uh, and strengthen protection for survivors and enhance education for young people about the dangers of sexting and deepfakes. Uh, this was a piece of legislation that I originally filed in 2015, and it does take a long time. It takes a lot of perseverance uh, to get it over the finish line. There were a lot of complications with this, and I'm delighted to say that the idea for that particular piece of legislation 
originated with Officer, uh, Lieutenant now, uh, Jason Riley of the Franklin Police Department who called to my attention an incident that happened at the Franklin High School back then and looking for ways to provide an educational opportunity for our kids and our students without having lifelong consequences such as a felony conviction would, uh, would provide. So this legislation grew, uh, a lot of other ideas were incorporated into it, uh, but uh, it was signed just a few weeks ago and uh, it was great to have uh, off of Lieutenant Riley with us. Uh, he was there t giving testimony at all the committee hearings. He was on the House floor the day we passed it, uh, right up front, and uh, he was there at the bill signing, uh, met the governor, and she gave him a pen uh, from that particular signing. So uh, at home, uh, work that was done uh, up at the State House. Our dear friend, another police uh, employee, Benjamin Franklin, uh, <laughs> thanks to the uh, lovely work of, uh, of Chair Mercer, uh, was uh, visiting the State House uh, on a very busy day. Uh, the last few days of the session uh, seemed to be the craziest. And what relief uh, Ben Franklin, uh, with a calming police dog, offered uh, in a very uh, difficult situation. Uh, he was brought in by his uh, child trainer, Ellie Dalton, and uh, she was uh, uh, honored on the House floor, uh, received a standing ovation from all 160 members, and it was great to have her there, and she invited uh, all of the members of the legislature to come out in the hall to take selfies and uh, meet uh, Ben Franklin. And I just, uh, as I was sitting back there tonight, uh, that visit and uh, Ellie's journey uh, with Ben Franklin is uh, featured in the American Kennel Society magazine uh, this particular month, and they, they just uh, shot me a copy of the uh, <coughs> online version of that article. So thank you to Ellie, thank you to Tom, and thank you uh, for Ben Franklin for uh, instituting some calm on the other <laughs> of the He does help. Uh, also, in this particular session, we did uh, coordinate with uh, a Franklin company, True Green, to get 100 trees donated to the town of Franklin and uh, those trees are gonna help uh, support the Commonwealth and the town's initiatives in combating uh, climate change. <coughs> and they were put to very good use and I thank the, uh, I thank the DPW for uh, stepping up to the plate and finding homes for these trees and even some of them were uh, given out in a lottery to residents uh, to take. Uh, these trees will provide monetary savings for Franklin residents adding up to $43,614.87. Uh, as you know, the uh, Tri-County School, uh, that vote was successful. They're gonna build a new school. It's gonna be a, a very uh, beautiful facility. And uh, one of the things that we were uh, chatting with the folks there about was trying to take advantage of new technology for renewable uh, energy to provide uh, power, heat, and air conditioning for that school. Uh, and we brought out uh, Emily Reichardt, the Chief Executive Officer for the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, to Tri-County to meet with school officials, talk to them about ways that they could finance uh, some of these uh, uh, transitional renewable uh, programs, such as uh, solar, which they had solar panels there already. Yeah. Unfortunately, they have to remove that solar field in order to put the new school in place, but they will uh, hopefully use solar on the rooftop of that. But we were exploring geothermal uh, well technology uh, and uh, what seemed to be a costly add to that school. Uh, actually, after the CEC folks met with them, they can take advantage of the Massachusetts Greenworks program, which was part of the FY24 budget. They can also take uh, advantage of some of the uh, IRA funding from the federal government. Uh, by the end of that conversation, they were down to a few hundred thousand dollars added on to the cost of that building. But they will not pay for energy. They won't have a gas bill moving forward. So they will recover that money uh, very quickly. And I was uh, happy to be able to uh, bring out a team from Mass CEC to meet with these officials and hopefully they will uh, follow through with that. Um, as you know, I do a lot in the offshore wind space with my committee and 
Uh, I joined uh, the committee on a tour of the marine terminal uh, and the FOSS marine terminal down in New Bedford. And it's amazing to see the economic prosperity that this industry is bringing to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. We met with officials from the city of New Bedford who said they have not seen this level of economic activity in that city in over 50 years. And people are getting jobs, uh, we're getting uh, renewable energy that's going to lead to energy independence for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for the first time in a long time. The city of New Bedford was uh, the city that lighted the world with whale oil 100 years ago. And in the next few years, they're going to be the city that's going to light Massachusetts uh, with offshore wind. So that was a, a great piece uh, bringing home for uh, that particular area. Housing, uh, we passed uh, the Affordable Homes Act, uh, and it was signed by the governor just a few weeks ago. And that's a, a powerful first step in tackling the state's housing affordability uh, crisis. It authorizes $5.16 billion in bond authorizations and tax credits to spur housing production in Massachusetts uh, and to facilitate the development of affordable housing and preserve public housing in Massachusetts. I think one of the biggest complaints we hear uh, as, uh, as legislators is the high cost of housing, and this is our effort uh, to do that. Uh, some of the specific pieces, $2 billion is for the rehabilitation, that's $2 billion with a B, is for the rehabilitation, repair, and modernization of more than 40,000 public housing units across the state. It also includes an extra $1 million for the Franklin Housing <coughs> Authority, which Senator Rausch was, uh, was spearheading, and $3 million for the Franklin Ridge Senior Housing Project here. So that adds to the pie uh, that, mm. uh, that we need mm. and need a lot more. Uh, provide <laughs> some housing. Need a lot more. You, you need a lot more, but you know, it's, it's uh, a $3 start. million dollars <laughs> is, a, is a big number added on to some, some federal funds and other monies that are out there. And I did get a, a note uh, in from John Jewell just last week saying uh, he was grateful for that. They're going to move forward with their application. So uh, we're in good shape. It also uh, allows accessory dwelling units as of right in single family zones. So that allows some people who want to, I think uh, Kobe was featured in the Globe on <laughs> this particular element, but uh, uh, it will, will allow people to uh, bring in family members uh, to their homes. Uh, a bunch of uh, 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 preferences for affordable housing for low or moderate income veterans is part of that, and also some support services uh, for veterans uh, in there as a, a, a veteran supportive housing program to assist uh, qualified nonprofit organizations to develop and preserve supportive housing for eligible veterans, all part of that bill. Um, I won't go through some of the other particulars. As I said, this is all laid out. I have a whole piece on uh, this bill. Uh, we did uh, do another veterans bill that was uh, signed into law just a few days ago. Uh, just so that folks know, current data for Massachusetts shows that there are 545 homeless veterans in the Commonwealth. And of these veterans, 274 are already in transitional housing, and only 33 are on shelter. So we've done a lot over the years to address this issue of uh, veteran homelessness, and it really shows that we're down to 33 at this level. And that 33 includes people who refuse Don't want, yeah. to uh, take any uh, services from the, gov uh, the government. But uh, we passed an act honoring, empowering, and recognizing our service members and veterans, the HERO Act. Uh, and that boosts the support for hundreds of thousands of individuals across the state who have served in the United States military, including nearly 30,000 women veterans and thousands of LGBTQ <coughs> uh, veterans. And it's going to increase benefits for veterans and Gold Star family members and uh, establish some new recognitions for military uh, service. Uh, we have the uh, Future Tech Act, which is going to, uh, it's a bond authorization to modernize the Commonwealth's digital infrastructure and create safer and more accessible experiences for residents. 
employees alike. We passed uh, wage <coughs> equity legislation, which uh, is uh, to close the gender and racial wage gap in the Commonwealth by passing the act, which requires employers with 25 or more employees to disclose a salary range when posting a position. And it protects the employee's right to ask their employer for the salary range for their position when for applying for a job. And uh, I think Massachusetts was the 11th state to uh, pass this particular law. And I'll end up on the topic of, of firefighters. Uh, and the governor is going to sign this bill uh, tomorrow, I believe. And uh, we're going to get a new law to shield firefighters from toxic chemicals contained in their protective equipment and eventually phase out the use of PFAS that's been uh, linked to cancer. Uh, and uh, that bill was uh, enacted on the final day <coughs> of the formal session. There were a few bills that did not make it over the hurdle, including a climate and energy bill that uh, I have been working on all session. Uh, but uh, folks uh, need to be reminded the just because the formal sessions end on July 31, that does not mean we left for home on vacation. Uh, the, the uh, legislature continues to meet two days a week, and that will be the case right up until January 1st, which is the day of the swearing in for the new session. And uh, we continue to work as conference committees on uh, economic development, climate uh, today, and I know Senator Rush is going to talk about the maternal health bill uh, that uh, reached a, an agreement uh, and, and for their conference committee. Uh, just this afternoon. So work is continuing to go. Um, uh, I know we have some really important <coughs> pieces in the climate and energy bill that we need to get over the hurdle uh, in this particular year, and I'll do everything in my uh, power to make sure that that happens. So that gives you a sense of uh, what uh, uh, we have been working on, and uh, I'll turn it over to Secretary. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah, did you get a promotion? Yeah. Uh, I know. To Senator Roush. <laughs> And uh, we can tell you, sure both of us would be happy to entertain any questions after. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Great to see all of you. Um, great to be with you and, and to be back here. Um, always a pleasure, of course, to, um, to join my, my good friend, Representative Roy, Mr. Franklin, as we sometimes call him on the Hill. Um, but uh, just a quick background. I know many of you on the council already know this, um, but a quick background for those who are listening. Um, I, I can hardly believe it, but I'm now rounding out my third term as your state senator um, serving in the Senate, uh, which is just wild to me that it's already been the better part of a decade. It goes really fast. You started when you were two? Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> 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 um, I am currently serving um, as the Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on Environment and Natural Resources, the Chair of the Senate Committee on the Census, uh, the Senate uh, excuse me, the vice chair on the Senate Committee on the Census, the vice chair on the Senate side for the Joint Committee on Children, Families, and Persons with Disabilities, and I also sit on four additional legislative committees, including the committees on education and revenue. Um, so my responsibilities are vast. Just in the committee appointments, I also serve on the board of the Massachusetts Women's Caucus, uh, Women Legislative Caucus. I serve on the board of the National Association of Jewish Legislators, um, and I also serve on our state's Hate Crimes Task Force. Um, in addition, within my office and within our district, um, including many individuals um, from right here in Franklin, I have a small business advisory council. We meet a few times a year um, to inform um, my legislative work and also our budgetary work, and you'll hear a little bit more about that um, in a couple of minutes. Um, and we also continue to develop our, our pretty robust youth outreach efforts, um, which have been really, really terrific. We have a fall virtual town hall that actually started during COVID. Um, right, one of the silver linings of COVID is that we know how to do things uh, through Zoom, so that's nice. Um, young people can't always drive to a meeting, so you know it makes it very uh, useful um, to be able to host a youth legislative town hall virtually. Um, and we also host a spring youth summit in the state house that high schoolers are able to apply for and attend. Um, and we bring in high school students from all across the district every spring. Um, they spend an entire day in the state house, including several from right here in Franklin. Um, they take a tour, but also they engage really deeply with my staff and other legislative staff. Um, and they culminate their day 
um, making pitches, legislative pitches to me and my director of legislation and policy um, on bills that we may in fact file coming up in the next term. Um, so happy to talk more about um, any of those efforts, of course, but I'll try to I'll try to not repeat the things that Representative Roy said because I know the hour is getting on. Uh, but I am just thrilled. I actually only earlier today took this tally. Um, so I'm particularly excited to share because it's even new information to me. But I have successfully advanced 15 bills this term, um, which is just a phenomenal number. Um, and so I'm really proud of that, two of which, um, unfortunately, the House didn't take up. But hopefully, we will, we will get to that point soon. Um, one of which is actually quite a simple thing. Um, the Massachusetts law still criminalizes blasphemy, if you can believe it. It's unconstitutional and unenforceable and has a really fascinating history that I'm happy to share with you offline. Um, but uh, I filed a bill to repeal the criminalization of blasphemy, which used to be punishable by death. Um, and once they took rid of, you know, got rid of the death penalty, then you could be punished for blasphemy by a red hot poker through the tongue um, and some other, in it's very fascinating history. Um, the Senate did pass that bill um, as part of a, a bigger comprehensive legislative package, but unfortunately, um, the House actually passed a similar bill um, and it just, they just kind of crossed in, in the process. So we didn't get that over the, uh, the finish line this session. Um, Another one that I remain deeply committed to that I know um, several of you are, are also focused on is the Comprehensive Plastics Reduction Act. Um, this was passed in an overwhelming um, supermajority bipartisan vote in the Senate, 38 to 2. Um, it is my lead legislation that takes, it is the most comprehensive, most expansive single-use plastics reduction legislation ever in the history of the Commonwealth. Um, it, uh, boosts a lot of the efforts that we're already seeing here in Franklin and various other communities. Um, but this is, this is essential. Um, it is an essential component of our work on climate action. Um, we have to address plastics. They are made from fossil fuels. They pollute from the second the implementation process even starts. Um, and they continue for hundreds and, in some cases, thousands of years, um, causing significant harm to our environment, our planet, and also to our personal health. Um, we all, in fact, sitting here right now, have micro and nanoplastics in our bodies. All mm -hmm. of us, guaranteed. Um, so we will continue to work to pass the Plastics Reduction Act. And as you heard Representative Roy say, you know, it's not, it's not over until the end of the day on December 31st. So I suppose anything is still possible, but most likely um, we'll have to keep working on that Plastics Redux Act next session. Um, so I worked on that bill for nine years. <laughs> <laughs> it, it continues to be an iterative process. <laughs> um, there are three of my bills that are still in negotiation, uh, having passed different versions in both the Senate and the House. Um, one, uh, two of them actually pertain to healthcare cost oversight and cost containment. Um, I won't go into the details, it's, it's really gnarly and nerdy, uh, but happy to do that offline if anyone <coughs> would like. Um, an additional bill that is a wholehearted feel-good bill um, that would create a choreographer laureate position for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. This is not just a wonderful thing for community building and the arts, um, but also for tourism and economic growth um, throughout the Commonwealth. Um, so that is part of that economic development bill that uh, Representative Roy mentioned during his remarks um, that still has not yet come to an agreement between the two chambers, which I, I think I'd probably speak for both of us where we can say that we really hope that does get to agreement. Um, I certainly stand at the ready to go back in and take a vote on it. Um, and then I have 10 additional bills that I filed that, have, that are either on their way to the governor's desk right now um, or have already been signed into law um, some of which are, uh, are sort of uh, iterative and process or le legislative fixes that we needed because successor organizations have been created and things like that, um, but also um, some of which creates uh, student recovery housing for um, college students um, working through SUD, um, a diaper changing stations, pilot program, um, and uh, electronic voting for condo boards, uh, right? This is actually really important to implement a lot of the provisions that are in that affordable, uh, the uh, Homes Act that Representative Roy mentions, comprehensive housing legislation. Um, 
and several bills that are in this composite uh, maternal health legislation that was just the, co the uh, conference report was just filed literally hours ago, um, which is incredible. It's a huge success. It's going to significantly improve um, access to a, a access and, and in fact equity um, in a wide variety of maternal health care. Um, one of the central pillars, in fact, the, the really big central pillar to that bill, uh, to the package, is my bill. Um, to provide licensure for certified professional midwives. These are the midwives who provide uh, birth care out of hospital settings. Um, this is a massive thing. We are behind nearly every other state in the country um, in getting this finally to done. The Senate actually previously passed that legislation and now um, I'm thrilled to say that both chambers have passed it and we're looking at enactment in the coming days. Um, also included in that bill, uh, the, in the comprehensive package is a, a legislative piece to make pediatric care more accessible um, by just changing the way the insurance works um, from once every 12 months, which makes you later and later and later every time you have to cancel an appointment um, or reschedule to once per calendar year. So it doesn't change the fiscal bottom line, just makes it a lot easier for parents and caregivers to get their kids to the doctor. Um, and also, uh, providing a number of pieces to support post-pregnancy <clears throat> mental health care. Um, this is a huge deal, um, and it, it encompasses all of the various ways that pregnancies might come to an end, because we know from our own lived experiences um, and from the lived experiences of all of our constituents that not all pregnancies result in babies. Um, and so, uh, so we've got a lot of really good stuff um, in that bill that should be coming, it's gonna to come to the House floor for sure tomorrow, and uh, I'm waiting to hear if we're gonna take it up in the Senate as well. Um, let's see here. Uh, you heard about several of the bills that were um, passed and already signed into law by the governor, passed by both chambers. Um, so I'll try not to mention the ones, or not to rehash the ones that Rep. Roy already covered. Um, just a, a bit of, a, I think additional, maybe you said this, I'm sorry if I'm duplicating, um, but on the Affordable Homes Act, uh, there's a, did you mention this 150 million about the decarbonization? No. This is great. So uh, the bill, in addition, this is the largest investment authorization in housing in the history of, this, of the state. This is a really big deal. Um, and in addition to all the pieces like ADUs and other things that Rep. Roy mentioned, um, the bill also invests 150 million to decarbonize public housing. Um, which is massive. So uh, that, that in addition uh, to the various pieces, including the three million for the senior housing here and 100 million, excuse me, 10, 1 million. I'm just gonna increase it as we sit here. <laughs> <laughs> 1 million for the I'm housing authority. Right yeah, <laughs> terrific, got it. It's uh, out in the car. Um, we also passed legislation uh, called the Parentage Act. This law um, updates really outdated statutes um, and recognizes all the various kinds of families that we have here in the Commonwealth, the beauty of all the different families. Um, that uh, bill is in particular so essential to our LGBTQ plus um, community members and friends and neighbors. Um, it does include a, a standalone bill that I had filed about birth certificates, um, which is a, a funky, problem that previously, but I'm glad to say, no longer exists in our state law, um, particularly an issue for single parents. Um, there's, there was a piece of our law that said that birth certificates have to, have to list um, biographical information about both parents. And so when you have a child brought into this world um, with a single parent by choice, our forms inherently told that child from the moment they were born that there was something missing from their lives because there was a blank line on this form. And, um, and we've now passed legislation and signed it into law to change that. Um, and so it now it, you can have however many parents are actually involved in that particular child's life. That's how many parents go on the birth certificate form. Um, talked about the veterans bill, we talked about the housing bill, future tech, salary transparency. Um, did pass a comprehensive gun violence prevention bill um, that does a variety of things, including really just bringing us into compliance with a, an agreement um, with federal law on point. Um, so you know, a lot of pieces on that. The f and we also strengthened the red flags law 
um, by adding some additional people like school administrators and licensed healthcare providers as um, potential petitioners. Um, that bill that got over the finish line um, was supported by both um, the chiefs of police in our state and also gun violence prevention advocates. Uh, this is a real team effort there. Um, and you heard about the budget, a big whopper of a 50, $58 billion budget in fiscal 25. Um, some of the other pieces um, included in, in the budget this cycle, this year, um, free community college, huge deal. Um, universal free school meals for K-12 continued going forward. Um, $475 million in C3 grants for early education providers. That is absolutely essential money to that sector and to parents across the state. Um, you heard about the $104 per pupil increase in Chapter 70 funding, $194 million for veterans, which is up 11% from the previous year. Um, you heard about the Genocide Education Trust Fund with a $3 million allocation. There are actually numerous pieces, um, and I know this is particularly important to so many people here in Franklin, <coughs> about combating anti-Semitism, as we've seen such a stark rise in it um, since 10-7. So the, the Senate actually adopted really four distinct pieces um, that made it to the finish line. The governor is now signed into law, including the $3 million for the Genocide Education Trust Fund, um, an amendment that I actually crafted and filed to require the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security to prepare an issue report on the state of hate in the Commonwealth um, that's not limited to anti-Semitism, but all forms of hate, and not just those um, incidents that rise to a level of a hate crime, which is actually a very high threshold to meet. We really need to know about everything that's going on. Um, and then there are a couple of outside sections uh, that provide resources on anti-Semitism to schools and teachers, and also creating a special commission to combat anti-Semitism. Um, that's in addition to two and a half million on civics education, 1.8 million for suicide prevention and mental health services. That includes Hey Sam the Youth Mental Health Text Line, uh, which I know many of you know about, just by the heads shaking. Um, $200,000 for the Women's History Center and Women's Hall of Fame. Uh, $125,000 for a Plastics Alternatives Small Business Pilot Program. Um, that's a grant program for small businesses to make the shift um, away from plastics and toward more eco-friendly products. Um, <coughs> And you heard me mention earlier the, the diaper changing stations and the student recovery housing pilot programs. Um, so those last few are, are some of my own statewide initiatives that um, I'm proud to say got over the finish line. Um, you heard about all of your funding, I think. <laughs> uh, I got a nice table here. Um, thanks to my amazing staff um, with all of your funding from for Franklin for fiscal 22 all the way up through and including the current fiscal 25. Um, but the grand totals for the town continue to increase every fiscal year. Um, and, uh, and we're proud to do that work on your behalf. Um, and uh, I won't go into all these details, uh, but it's really been a pleasure to join you here in Franklin for so many wonderful events. Um, we've hosted office hours at the Senior Center. We've got the Harvest Festival coming up. Not next month, two months from now. Right? October. Yeah. October. September. September. Next September. month. It is next yeah. month. <laughs> right. The Safe Coalition Gala. We're, we, we were just at Dean College not too long ago. Um, and uh, I will be doing another Fall Town Hall series also next month. Um, and the last thing is to answer Councillor Pellegri's question earlier posed um, about early voting for young people. So if you are a person who is registered to vote but is not yet 18, the short answer to your question, counselor, is don't cast your ballot until your birthday. <laughs> you cannot vote until you achieve the age of 18. So if you cast a ballot before your birthday, even though we have vote by mail and early voting, um, it won't count, right? So you, it will be disqualified. So you have to wait Good job registering to vote. Well done. If you haven't, you still can. Um, I think we're still outside the registration period, even for the primary, which is coming up, um, and well outside the, the deadline uh, for the general in November. So please do register to vote if you're going to turn 18 anytime between now and November 5th. Um, so you can vote in that election, but don't cast your ballot until the birthday comes. I'm so glad you brought that up because there's many people that don't know that. Yeah, it's really important. Thank you for asking the question. And of course, happy to answer any other questions.
Thank you uh, very much for uh, the informative updates on what's going on at the State House. Questions or comments from the Council? Councilor Cormier Ledger. Wow, I get to go first? Yes, you do. <laughs> wow. Nice having a name beginning with C. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't know anything about the actual R's sitting over here at the table. <laughs> right. So um, uh, thank you both for being here, and thank you both for everything that you do for Franklin. It's certainly no secret that we have great advocates at the State House, so thank you. Um, I'm hoping you can kind of touch a little bit on three things, and I'll mention all three, and then you can tackle it. Um, I happen to hear a lot from people looking for homes. You talked about money going into affordable housing, but we are still lacking in 40B deed restricted single family homes. And I hear a lot in a lot of different circles that there's just no incentives for developers to, to do that. They're too, it's just too expensive. It's better for them to do apartment buildings. So I'm just wondering if any of that money can maybe it is directed to that or maybe it can be directed to that but I happen to see a lot of people who would love that next step of getting out of renting and they'd love to be able to get a house but maybe making the leap with some of these housing prices right now just isn't possible uh, my second thing is what can we do together with your help to increase state funding for infrastructure because we have a pretty gigantic list, as Jamie would be happy to share with you at any given time. Last I checked, it was somewhere around $150 million in climbing um, between sewers, water lines, sidewalks, and roads. We rely on state funds for a lot of those projects because we just don't have the money. Some of those systems are aging pretty, pretty quickly. And then lastly, if you could touch on Prop 2.5. The, the giant question that maybe everybody in the Commonwealth is asking, the law has been in effect since I think 1981. It doesn't keep up with inflation. It hurts many towns and cities in many, many ways. I'm wondering if there's any appetite on the Hill to readdress that maybe so that cities and towns have a little bit more leeway to perhaps keep up with inflation costs instead of being limited with just 2.5% because I'm sure you're seeing not just here, but across the Commonwealth communities that are really struggling to pay for education and other things within the confines of 2.5%. So those are my three questions. Thank you. Well, let me give you my take on them uh, first on the uh, single family homes in trying to encourage uh, more uh, opportunities for people. That is the focus of the $5 billion in that housing bill. Um, the uh, MBTA Communities Act that we talked about earlier was to encourage uh, zoning for multifamily in uh, areas within a half a mile of, the, uh, uh, of an MBTA structure. Um, doesn't require any building whatsoever. Uh, that's up to the landowner. Uh, the piece about uh, accessory dwelling units is a way to help uh, people stay in their communities in a smaller uh, uh, location that's more cost effective. And uh, those are some of the things uh, that are in that particular housing bill. Um, whether we can increase state funding for infrastructure, um, you know, where we're giving close to $30 million for education uh, and it's close to $10 million for roads. Uh, that's a solid commitment from the mm -hmm. Commonwealth. Um, this may come as a surprise to you, but a lot of people don't like to raise taxes. Uh, <laughs> they don't like to vote for tax increases. So, uh, you know, your, your source of revenue is, uh, is basically uh, taxes. There's not much appetites. I think uh, you folks experienced uh, uh, that in attempting to do it here in the community. Uh, but the other ways that we can increase revenues uh, is to increase economic development. And some of the measures, uh, you know, I talked earlier about uh, what uh, the offshore wind industry is doing for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. How many of you knew uh, that Franklin Sheet Metal was providing some of the metal 
for uh, the offshore wind industry. Uh, they are. Uh, and that, you know, having these businesses flourish and having more employees and having more employees who are paying uh, income taxes and uh, businesses that are paying taxes, that's one way to increase revenue. So as we see uh, economic activity flourish, that hopefully will increase uh, the pot of revenue. And uh, I'll finally touch upon the, um, the millionaire's tax that uh, was uh, voted in by the voters of the Commonwealth. Uh, the revenues that came in for that were $2.2 billion. We had, were anticipating $1 billion. So the money is dedicated to education and transportation. And transportation infrastructure is something that is benefiting from that increased revenue. So you'll see some, uh, some increases, but um, you know, maybe not enough to cover everything that you want to do. And finally, on Proposition 2 and a half, I don't see an appetite uh, to make changes to that law. It was decided long ago by the voters of this Commonwealth mm -hmm. that uh, it should be decided uh, by a popular vote of that community as to whether or not they wanted to uh, spend more for services in their community. Um, you know, we've passed one in this community back in, I believe it was 2007. Uh, it's not an easy prospect, but it, it can be done. Uh, and um, I think the only way you'll see a change uh, would be to do a referendum again and send it back to the voters statewide to see if they want to change That's the only uh, Proposition way. Two and a Half. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, agree as to the, the last point um, and also the first point, um, right, that the Homes Act provides significant um, bond authorization investments in first time home buyers and, and has a number of specific provisions targeted directly to support first time home buyers. Um, I'd have to go back to you know, check the language on any of the real nitty gritty specifics. Happy to do that with you offline, counselor. Um, with regard to the state funding on infrastructure, I do just want, since I do have this handy table here that my staff crafted, um, just to kind of, e even in a shaky revenue moment, right? I think we can all be real about this. Um, state revenues have been down you know, below benchmark for a number of um, months in the past fiscal year. Right? The governor made 9C cuts. Um, right? The forecasts going forward are not particularly, you know, sunshine and roses, shall we say. Um, so, you know, we're in, we're in a belt tightening moment. That having been said, the money that the state has provided to Franklin has increased every single year for the last four years, right? Your unrestricted government aid was at 2.7 million in fiscal 22, 2.86 in fiscal 23, 2.95 in fiscal 24, and over 3 million in fiscal 25, right, this fiscal year. Um, your Chapter 70 money has gone up uh, by just over a million dollars over the last few years. That's just for, for Franklin District, right? Chad, the Tri-County Chapter 70 money has also gone up. Norfolk Aggie money has also gone up. Um, your Chapter 90 money has also gone up by a much smaller amount, but we're talking about much smaller dollars in the grand scheme of things, um, right? So your total amounts, including all the bits and pieces, all the you know specific earmark allocations that Jeff and I are able to get in for you um, and get across the finish line has increased from just slightly over $40 million in fiscal 22 to almost 42 and a half this year, um, even in a shaky fiscal moment. Um, so I you know, just wanted to provide those numbers by way of reference for everybody. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Any, Thank you. Uh, Councilor Chandler. Through you, Mr. Chairman. Hi, representatives. Thanks for all the resources you got us. We really appreciate that. And uh, Senator Rush, thank you. Your office helped me out with a problem. Um, Rep Roy, I have one for you coming up, so. Excellent. <laughs> I figured Happy you would out. like that. Nothing I like more than problems. <laughs> <laughs> solving solving, problems. solving problems. problems. You did solve a problem, thank you. <laughs> it wasn't in Franklin, that's why I went to her first, not you. Okay, so look, honestly, 
not everybody's doing well right now. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, it's actually embarrassing to say this is probably the worst economic year of my life. So I'm having some difficulty too. So a lot of people can't afford more taxes right now. And, you know, look, the biggest issue I think we have is the schools. I mean, just what they need. And you've hammered it home. I was going to ask you, like, what more could we do to get money? But you can say there isn't any more. You got us the most we can get. And thank you. Thank you. But, you know, I look at the $58 billion budget, and did you just say there's another billion possibly splitting up? I did say that there was $2.2 billion that came in okay. from the millionaire's tax, but that's incorporated in the $58 It's in that, okay. So it's, you know, people see $58 billion and they just wish that we could get a little more money, but I think you need to tell us that the only answer is an override, probably. That's the only way the Franklin School is going to get more money. It's not coming from the State House. We got what we're going to get. Yeah, I mentioned um, in my remarks that Franklin is a hold harmless community. Yeah. And what that means is that Franklin, under the formula, is getting more than it is entitled to under the formula. Right. But the, the community is not going to have to suffer for that. They will get on a path to get additional aid beyond the minimum number yeah. once they achieve the, uh, the foundation level that they're required to be at. Uh, but I don't know that that's going to happen in, in my lifetime. Um, oh, okay. But, uh, you know, so you're, you're looking at minimum. But keep in mind, yeah. the minimum increase uh, last year was $30 per student, or, yeah. or 50 This year we brought it up to 104 per uh, student. So that was a significant uh, increase. Yeah. Um, and we appreciate and that. And we're pushing. And we want to get the most that we possibly can uh, for this community. We, you know, we fight hard, uh, but you know, when I try to talk about the education aid, I'm reminded repeatedly, hey, you guys are already getting uh, more than uh, you should be. And right. I, I just want to piggyback on that Please. and say, you know, part of the reason that we were a big part of the reason that we were able to allocate $104 in per people state aid is because of the fair share amendment, right? Because of that $2.2 billion that came in that we otherwise would not, we just wouldn't have it, period. Um, and that that makes a huge difference. That is making a difference in your bottom line as the, you know, fiscal management body for this town. Um, and and in people's you know bottom lines in their households, um, you know I agree with Rep Roy. I don't think we're going to see a prop two and a half change anytime. So maybe my lifetime also. Um, but you know your, the cost of education. I mean that's just it. It is. It's 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 killing town budgets all throughout my yeah, district, not just here in Franklin. Everywhere. I, everywhere, everywhere, I know. And and a huge part of that, I think it's really important to say, is the 14% increase in costs for out-of-district special education placements that our former governor put into place with the stroke of a pen on his way out the door, mm -hmm. right? He just did it. And then we had to figure out how to clean up that mess right. that he left us with, right? That's that's what happened, right? Mm -hmm. That is what happened. Um, and that 14% increase, you know, in, in particular because of the way money does or doesn't follow a student um, who has an out of district special education placement um, has really wreaked havoc in, on a number of municipal budgets. I get it, Jeff gets it, we know that all of you get it. It's we, the school, our friends on the school committee, they get it too, right? Like, we get it, we, we hear you. Um, you know, is there a way to raise more money? I don't personally want to raise taxes on people who are, you know, trying to make ends meet at home. But I think there's a couple of interesting pr proposals out there to have multinational, multi-billion dollar corporations pay like a little bit more, right? The, the corporate minimum tax in Massachusetts is $456 per year. How many people paid more than $456 per year in your taxes? <clears throat> right? I mean, I think, I think if we took a survey, it would be every single hand in this room, right? If you paid more than 500 bucks, you're paying more than 
85% of the businesses in this state, including the ones that are making tens of billions of dollars of profit every single year and taking advantage of a variety of offshore tax havens that I have legislation pending to close, right? If we were able to close that, we'd have another, by all in, you know, estimates, between 400 and 500 million dollars in revenue in our state every year. Okay, so we could put that towards, right? All right, and close. A point I, I think you should consider when you're looking at the 58 billion. Yeah. Approximately 60 percent of that is health and human services. That's right. Yes. Yeah, it's that in yeah. It's the biggest secretariat in the state, and also the most, not only because of the employment, the the state employees, um, but also because of the cost of of ensuring mm -hmm. that people have access to health care. Yep. All right, in closing, just I, I appreciate all the money you got us. People need to know there's not a big bucket coming and people that can't afford more taxes, it's, it's just going to be a, a big issue. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Chandler. Councilor Plagri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, just to thank you for coming this evening. Um, my head is always filled when I have uh, the opportunity to listen to you and have all of this explained. Um, do I grasp it all? You know, and, and I'll go home tonight and I'll be thinking of all kinds of questions that I probably should have asked. Um, but one is the 29, almost 30 uh, million that's going to the education. I, you probably don't know how much Franklin is getting right now. That's that is the number for Franklin. $29,717,993. That is the Chapter 70 allocation to Franklin District Schools for fiscal 25. Okay. That's now that's that, not including Tri-County and Norfolk Aggie. Those are separate allocations. Just separate for the Franklin School. Right. Okay. And also separate from charter school reimbursements and other things. So was that helping their bottom line, I would assume, um, for money that they have now to spend on the students? Well, it's, it's been part of the budget yeah. for the schools since 1994 when yeah. we did that reform. And it, it grew. Franklin happened to be the fastest growing community in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in the 90s. So you saw these increases of up to $3 million a year in Chapter 78. Um, and, but it did level off once the community uh, enrollment uh, reached its pinnacle. And it has since dropped by, I want to say, 1,200 to 1,400 students uh, since the days when I was on the school committee. But even though you've had a drop in enrollment, the Chapter 70 money has continued to increase. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it, it's for the bottom line of the schools, but it, you know, as you well know, it's, it's never enough because the expenses are extraordinary to educate a child in 2024. I don't have any specific questions right now, but again, to say thank you for coming and giving us a lesson. I think we can all use that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Councilor Plagri. Councilor DeLoco. I got nothing. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I want to thank you guys for coming, obviously. Uh, it's always good to see you guys come in. Um, I do, uh, Council Comey and Ledger and myself, have have talked about that 40B together for a long time. Uh, it is sad. We, I mean, would we have 200,000 people move out of Massachusetts last year? I mean, my kids are moving out. I mean, they just they can't afford it. I mean, they just it's just it's just impossible for them to afford it. I mean, even if I would like to downsize to a small house, but why would I? Because I'm going to be paying the same as my own house. You know, I'd love to give my kids the I house. I want you to give your kids the house and let them. They're about. They're going to get it. Accessory dwelling unit. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, that's what you would love. Yeah. It's called the dog house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I agree. Even if you could get fifty five and older affordable housing, and then we could turn like our houses over to young families. You yeah. know what I mean? That would be great too. Um, but um, but you guys do great work up at the state house. Um, I mean, the gun bill right now, it's you passed it, but it's not in effect until 
October, right? Because the state police are not prepared to take on. The, you got to qualify with the state police now, so. They, yeah, I would have to check the the specific. Yeah, they, it was in effect right away, but then they had right. to stop it. Yeah, there's there's yeah, there's, yeah there's, I think there's because, some ramp up time. Because we get a lot of people applying for gun permits right now. Yeah. <laughs> but for <laughs> for some of the provisions in the yeah. bill, some of them took effect, I think, if memory serves, immediately. Yeah. But I think the pieces that you're talking about had a what yeah, we call sun, sunrise just, date for yeah, later. They're not out. they're not prepared yet. They, yeah, they, they just got thrown later. onto them and they were. Like, they're not prepared. Uh, but on another note, outside of what you do up at the State House, um, there's other things you do. This afternoon, myself and Jeff Roy were in a, in a home. I don't want to get into the problem they have, but it's a very serious problem. Um, and they couldn't get it, they, they didn't know where to turn, so they called me. I called Jeff. We made an appointment. They feel a little better tonight. I think they're sleeping a little better tonight. It, can we do anything? We don't know, but we're gonna try like hell. And uh, I thank you for that, and they thank you for that because that meant a lot to them. So that, that's the other part they do. That's just not what they do up at the State House. They're out in the community. They're helping people that you don't even know. So I do thank you for that, and I thank you for your, all your work. As a reminder, of the woman that we worked with uh, when she lost her husband's pension. Oh, yeah. that was another one. That's we finally that, got that over the finish line. That required line a bill. Right. That, uh, we actually <laughs> had to file and uh, get it through the House and Senate yep. to the governor's desk. Uh, the appeals process for her to appeal uh, to get her pension back was, four, was about four years. It's a sad state of affairs when you can get a piece of legislation done through the great and general court faster than you can get an, an appeal done. And there was no, uh, there was no uh, clear-cut answer as to whether she was going to get it. But there's a woman who was at risk of, of losing, losing her everything. Home. And she's going to be on the street. Everything. Right. She was right. really going to be on the street. Yeah. And and she said to me. Jeff called her and said, the money's going to be in the banking account at midnight. She said, I stayed up till midnight to check to make sure that, they, <laughs> that, they, that money went in there. And, she, and of course, she was crying, and she gave us all big hugs. But that was a great, that was another that's great story. That's, that's another great story. Yeah. So. We got that one through real fast. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Councilor DeLarco. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the time. Um, most of the important stuff, sorry, been mentioned. Kudos to my fellow councils for bringing up some of the major topics of concern for the town of Franklin. I mean, if it were me, I'd, I'd put an invisible shield around Franklin and not really care about any of the other communities in the state of Massachusetts because I represent the town of Franklin. That's all I care about is how much can you get for us, what can you do for us, what, et cetera, et cetera. Schools obviously being the number one topic of issue. We've already talked about that at some length tonight. But, of course, I, w I wouldn't be doing my due diligence if I at least didn't hope that you could find the means to find us more funding to help our kids. I mean, that's important, and I know you hear it all the time. Um, so I'm not going to beat that drum any more than I need no. to. Um, you know, a lot of what you've talked about tonight, especially the housing bill, I was thinking about poor Ed Augustus, the Secretary of Housing, and how much more work he's going to have. But hopefully we can, through, this fun, through the funds the community's going to get, um, we can try to meet some of the, some of the needs. Um, he's making history. He's the first yep. Secretary yeah. of yeah. Housing, so he has no bar to uh, match mm -hmm. it. It's, it's all work for him. And, it's all, and I'm sure he'll do a great job yeah. with that as well. Um, quick question. Um, why, you, you had mentioned a number, that corporations, 400 and something. $456. That is the corporate minimum tax in Massachusetts. Corporate minimum tax. Okay. Um, just a curious question. Um, as myself, a small business owner, I, as in owning my own LLC, I have to file an annual report with the state secretary's office every single year. There's a $500 fee <laughs> mm -hmm. just for filing mm -hmm. an annual report that I have to go on his website and yep. update. Yep. With a $20 convenience fee. 
that, it, how many corporations are there in the state of Massachusetts? Yeah, I, I don't know, Time but that's a good question. I, I think there are a number of, well, I, I haven't, uh, Councilor Jones, I haven't heard, actually heard your question yet, but if you're asking for a comment on that particular problem, I'm happy to provide it. <laughs> well, it's just if I, if I don't know exactly how many corporations are in the state of Massachusetts, but that alone is millions of dollars worth of fee funds that mm -hmm. I'm just curious to go, where does that money go? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I would have to look at the records. All of that money goes through the secretary's office, um, as I'm sure you know, because you file and several other people here are small business owners file yeah. the same same paperwork, same fee, same yeah. service fee. Uh, I think there is a, a wealth of opportunity to make significant improvements to a variety of the divisions and subdivisions within the auspices of the Secretary of the Commonwealth. Um, most of them, actually. Um, they are largely outdated and antiquated. Um, it even includes our the back end of our um, voting systems, voting registration um, and elections operation systems that any town you could bring up our town clerk again, she could tell you all about it. Um, you know, things that need just drastic modernization. Um, and, you know, and that's, you're right, you are right. There's a, there's a big disconnect there. I'm gonna give you a little tip. If you change from an LLC to a professional corporation, yep. your filing fee would be 125. So I would just say $375. From an LLC to what? A, 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 a PC. You still pay nice more job. your fee than the, than the than all the corporate corporations. taxes do. Oh, Work for but that, that just shows you really, you know, I mean, look, there's, there's plenty of discussion that we could have about, you know, the operations within the corporations division and the secretary's office and the mess of the lobbying loopholes and the lobbying registration and filing problems and there's just there's a lot of that that needs to be updated and fixed um it's not like the you know big exciting topic that you hear about every day but there's plenty of opportunity for growth and development there but what the point that really drives home to me is that is how ridiculous it is that we have this flat 456 dollar tax rate for 85 you know 85 percent of the businesses in the state pay the corporate minimum tax now that's not to say some shouldn't pay Four hundred fifty-six dollars. Some should, but you know, maybe a sliding scale would make more sense, right? right? Yeah. Well, and and certainly for companies, you know, multi-billion-dollar, multinational companies, uh, yeah, I think they could probably pay a little bit more to help out our bottom line, so that you know, yeah. all the issues that literally every single one of you is talking about, we could put a little more money into. Absolutely. And in my last topic, uh, my third point is really just and I know it's been stated already, is just to kind of keep beating the drum on funding for Franklin Ridge. I mean, we'd, also, we'd, oh, yeah. love, we'd love to break ground on that project as soon as we can. I think by the time we break ground, I'll probably be needing the senior living <laughs> myself. Um, but hopefully hopefully we can move forward. Thank you for the funding. I thought you colored that here. They, well, <laughs> it, Just say yes, Councilor. It, it, it didn't look like this 15 years ago, that's for sure. But, uh, just to highlight a few points that my fellow council has already said, thank you so much for all the hard work that you both put in at the State House. I am kind of sad that a few things didn't get passed. Um, you know, my union in particular was particularly sad about the whole PLA thing, kind of not making it through with the economic development bill uh, and other things like that. I, I, and I know there's a lot because I was actually watching some of the sessions. Um, and everyone trying to get a lot of bills passed through. So uh, thank you for your hard work. I look forward to uh, next time around. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Councillor Hamlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To the chair, um, to both of you, thank you so much for all the work you do for Franklin. It's pretty amazing um, when the, everyone always is saying this year, like nothing gets done, but things did get done, and I, won't, and I think people should remember that. And um, the, all of the money that you get for the town and the people that are less fortunate and need help is just amazing, but you do it for other communities as well. So, um, and I hope they're as happy about what you do for them as we are, or what you do for us. I um, wanted to just um, root you on to keep working on the climate change bill. I know you will, Jeff, um, and the economic development bill is really important. 
And um, I have a question about, I have like these lists of things that I wrote down while you were both speaking. So on the affordable, affordable housing um, bill, is there any incentives in there for accessible, accessible housing for people with all of it, with um, different abilities? And um, the, keep working on the reduction of single use plastics. Uh, I did write down encourage uh, the, the study of other materials like plant based plastics, but mm -hmm. you did mention that there was another, that you were working on something else with, about that. Um, and um, yesterday, Governor Healy was on the news about her electric trains. Um, the Fairmont line is great, but we need it everywhere. So please continue to fight or start to fight for mass transit that works and is efficient. I mean, we're getting there, but we have to keep pushing it. Um, and, and so thank you again. Uh, I didn't uh, apologize if, I, if you said something about accessible housing in that, if there was any incentives for that, but I didn't, if you could answer that, or yes or no. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I don't think we did. Yeah. The, I'll check it out. It's, okay. it's a 150-page bill, Yeah. and uh, yeah. I don't remember every detail. <laughs> <laughs> I will it's quite all right. Have one of your staff do it for you or something. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, no, we can get back to you on that. I, yeah. I know that in the Senate debate, we did include provisions about not just affordable housing, but also accessible housing. I just don't off the cuff remember what those specifics okay. are and which of those specifics made it into the final deal right. because neither of us was on the conference committee for that okay. legislation right, right. That's um right. and uh i did look at it before we enacted it and sent it to the governor um but i i just off the cuff i just don't remember and the no. decarbonization of that bill is just i think that's wonderful for the public for public housing yeah. because um if that makes it less affordable <coughs> for somebody to live there because right. they're because they don't have a utility bill right it's like even better it's way more affordable than if you're not paying for electricity and heat and things like that. Right. Um, and hopefully they'll put some air conditioning into some of the housing because um, we know with climate change, everybody's going to need it. And, um, but thank you for all the work you do. I really appreciate it. Uh, Franklin is a step ahead in putting heat pumps in mm -hmm. the Franklin Housing Authority as they change things over. So that provides not only heat, but uh, air conditioning. So right. There was yeah. a pilot project that was done in Framingham that uh, was using network geothermal mm -hmm. that is providing heat and uh, air conditioning to Mass Bay Community College, the Framingham Housing Authority, a residential street, uh, the fire department, uh, and even a gas station, all being powered uh, by these uh, network geothermal wells, which is uh, giving heating and air conditioning for every Franklin uh, Framingham Housing Authority mm -hmm. resident. That's wonderful, right? Thoroughly, Thoroughly everything will work out okay, and then we'll continue yeah, to pilot project. Yeah. 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 There are a number of pilot projects ongoing about electrification as well. Yeah, great. In um, 10, 10 communities, I think, yeah. memory serves. Yes. Yeah. 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 All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hamlin. Councillor Frangillo. Yeah. Uh, my first advice would just be to listen to Councillor Hamlin. Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, Why just Done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Next. You know. <laughs> uh, I particularly echo just a few of them because I, I, I won't have to say them all again. But uh, particularly echoing, yeah, uh, continuing to work on, on particularly the siting and permitting around uh, energy so that we can um, have enough uh, power to um, have air conditioning and, and all the units that are going to need it. Um, and uh, another uh, echo of just our gratitude for passing the housing uh, bond bill as, as mm. a priority. Uh, and then my, you know, one thing I was going to leave you with for, you know, um, where I think this, the state legislature continues to fall short, if, um, if I had to point a finger, would be on regional transportation and, and public transportation. Um, and so the funding of... Um, the rail lines, the modernization of the rail lines, electrification, double tracking, so that we can actually increase the frequency, the speed, and the reliability of um, our commuter rail, as well as increasing funding, which there still was a lot of increased funding 
but continuing to increase funding for our regional transit authorities um, that change the way that people can move around and, and afford to live um, in, in places like Franklin. Those would be the big things, but my, my biggest thing would just be gratitude for you all. We have uh, just you know, arguably the most accessible um, and, and present uh, legislative delegation of, of any community. I thank you all for, you know, I, I thank you both for just being so present and uh, available and um, showing up to uh, small events. And I just always know that I, I have your ear, so that's really helpful. On the double track piece, because you, you were in, yeah. in the office, so you knew what a priority that was <laughs> uh, for us to get that done. Uh, if you look from Main Street in Franklin and you look down mm -hmm. the tracks towards Boston, you'll see two sets of tracks coming mm -hmm. in just before Franklin Station. Right. That did not exist uh, two years ago. No. And that's there. It's not running yet. There's still another section mm -hmm. in the Norfolk Walpole area that needs to be completed, and they have some uh, other testing that has to be done. But once that's up and running, I'd expect that line to be a lot more reliable and uh, getting people in and out. Hopefully, they'll even introduce some express lines uh, from Franklin in. But we stay on the T uh, constantly. And another piece that uh, is, is going to happen is going to be a, um, an accessible ramp constructed yeah. at yeah, thank uh, you. the Franklin yeah. Dean Station. Uh, the, some of the folks from the Rise yeah. Up uh, group here in Franklin uh, raised that as an issue. Uh, we raised it <coughs> as an issue with uh, the MBTA, uh, and they're coming through. As a matter of fact, I took the train today and uh, the, the area is fenced off, and there oh, wow. is a backhoe in there uh, ready right. to uh, do the construction. So <coughs> Thank you for that. I, want, I want to just pick up on the RTA piece. Um, the Senate actually included, I think overall in the budget, this is the biggest allocation in any fiscal year yeah. for the RTAs um, throughout the state, yeah. across the board. Um, so we are making historic investments in RTAs. The Senate um, actually, um, this is a piece that I personally pushed through, so I wanted to make sure to mention it, um, especially because you raised it. Um, the Senate included a $10 million allocation specifically for RTAs to address interoperability, right? And this is something that, you know, especially with a district as, as big and um, geographically interesting as mine, um, you know, you can get to sort of a certain point on a single RTA and then you can't get to the next one because there's they don't talk to each other, right? There's no overlap. Um, and this is a huge problem, right? Like yeah. people who, you know, have health care down at Sturdy Hospital, for example, in Attleboro, but live, you know, just to the north of here in Norfolk and, and can't get to the hospital because <laughs> the RTAs don't talk to each other. Um, so there's $10 million that the Senate adopted um, to specifically address that particular problem. Um, so, you know, we continue to both make investments and, and also innovate and try to spur that innovation. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Frangillo. Councillor Sheridan. Yeah, I just want to say thank you for all you do. All this great, exciting stuff. I didn't know about the Franklin Sheet Metal. That's exciting news. Are they, are they the ones located down the Union Street? Cottage. Cottage Street, yeah. And also, uh, <clears throat> exciting news about the second track. I did not realize that. So eventually that will be two ways. That's great. Thank you for everything. Thank you, Councillor Sheridan. Everybody has yeah, asked yeah, my yeah. questions. Oh, I thought you were going to have a half hour. Yeah, <laughs> no. I do have one concern that I have that uh, as we move forward, I you keep, that up I keep, I keep <laughs> hearing about uh, the Chapter 70 formula being addressed or readdressed and my concern is the hold harmless uh, status that we have currently and if that goes away we're in deep trouble. I can tell you it won't go away while I'm Music to my ears. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's <coughs> so important to yeah, us right really now because if that ever disappeared, oh, yeah. uh, all in trouble. It's up, we, up the creek. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> that's all. I'm moving. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're already that. moving. You're moving to the back, yeah. <laughs> then, in the doghouse. Are, are there any questions in council chambers? I'll give you an opportunity. Please, Frank, come forward. Name and address, please. I hope you don't mind that I sit next to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Frank Edward Falvey, 920 Pond Street, Franklin, Mass, 02038. You know, now an individual gets to ask you individual questions. And my concern is sales tax on clothing is over $175 you pay your sales tax. That hasn't changed in years. So the value has gone down. The, the deduction, the standard deduction on the estate income form, I don't know how long that's been that it hasn't changed. And the ta the, if you invest in state banks, up to $200 in dividends or interest that you get from state banks, you can deduct on your taxes. State banks help the economic development of communities. I hear one of your legislatures wants to do away with it because he wants the $4 million to go for revenue. That $200 should be increased to like $700, $1,000. It should be significantly increased to have people transfer money from outside banks to local banks that are supporting their communities. $2.7 billion, you said, came in from raising. 2.2. 2.2 billion dollars came in because you, you raise the wealth tax. And if I understand that, went from transportation and education. Just clarify, yeah. we did not increase the wealth tax. That was the voters of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts who made that decision. Fine. I wasn't a legislator. Right. right. But what I want to point out is this stupid interchange project on 495 in the Mass Pike I understand it's costing around a half a billion dollars. Gotta be. Someone in setting priorities, in my opinion, has blown a half a billion dollars that could have been used elsewhere. Thank you. We need it. We need it. We need it. <laughs> Jane. Name and address, please. Jane Calloway Trip, 607 Maple Street. Um, I have a couple of questions. Either one can answer through the chair. Um, right now, in our state, in our town, we have people that are facing unemployment, struggling financially to make ends meet. The cost of food has skyrocketed. The only place personally in my budget that I can cut to pay any of the increases that are coming is a food budget. That's the only place left to cut because everything else is done. There's no going out, there's no vacations, there's no anything. And I'm at a point where I shop every two weeks for a family of five because that is what I can afford. Now, going to what I wanted to say, we have in this state for a family of four if you qualify for SNAP benefits based on your gross income, which is not the income you actually live on, the maximum amount a family of four can get is $973 a month. That does not mean they'll get that. That's the maximum they might get. However, the people, the migrant families that are living in this hotel are getting roughly $8,064 a month for a family of four in food vouchers. That's $7,091 more a month for a family of four can get, who are citizens, on SNAP. Mind you, our taxes 
pay for all of it. Now, our town administrator has updated us as much as he can with the information that he has, and I appreciate that. However, we have not been updated with the migrant situation in this town. Our taxes are coming from state and federal. All these grants are our tax money that is being held over our heads if we don't follow the mandates that the state and federal government say that we must follow, the unfunded mandates, which is also damaging our school system. They could release those and we might be okay on our budget. The people who are paying all these taxes and trying to pay their rents and their mortgage and their food and all that stuff get literally no assistance or bare minimum, yet our taxes in millions of dollars are going to fund these people. We didn't get a choice. We didn't get a vote. I don't really know how much we're learning. That hotel gave us hotel tax. It also should have been giving us property taxes. How much of their using our fire and emergency system? Who's paying for those bills? Because I know I had to pay for mine if I call 911. I also have to or my insurance do. Who's paying for theirs? If you tell me as the state and federal government, then it's us. We are funding them 150% and we are drowning. There is a problem with that. If you represent the people in this town and in this state, then you start representing us and not everybody else. Because we're the ones that are funding this entire country. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I didn't hear a question, so. Okay. Um, I, I want to Sure, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, for anyone who is having difficulty making ends meet or accessing SNAP or WIC or any of the other benefits um, and supports that our state government provides, please reach out. If you're having difficulty making ends meet and you and you may qualify for one of these one of these uh, programs, and if you're having difficulty managing that application process, let us know. We have staff that can help with those processes. Um, and we do that, that's part of what we do. Like Councilor DeLorco was saying earlier, this is part of what we do. Mm -hmm. um, and Councilor Jeff, several of you have mentioned this. Um, I've been dealing with a variety of questions about um, the emergency access housing program. I just wanna clarify um, some facts, <laughs> particularly about medical services. This is something I asked as well. Um, the utilization rates for ambulance services pretty much across the board is next to nothing um, from these locations, right? It's tiny. Um, so I just, I just want to clarify the record on, on that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Is there anyone else? Uh, just Wait. come forward up to the mic, please. Questions only or brief comments? Mm -hmm. Questions. Uh, it's really questions. That, uh, I'm, I'm looking for. Name and address, please. Hi, I'm Dasha Videra, 35 Marvin Ave. <clears throat> I have two particular questions. I'm very thankful, State Rep Roy, that you mentioned in regards to offshore wind. I had an opportunity to look at your OCPF findings, and a lot of your OCPF findings actually come from out of state. And 60,000 of those in probably the course of maybe two years, majority of those in 23, are actually from climate initiative companies. 4,000 of those are actually from the uh, Vineyard Wind Company. The parent company, I think it's called Anbid. Obviously, we had a dramatic situation that happened in Nantucket. Uh, and unfortunately, the debris from that has rippled all over the place in Cape Cod, and it's gone all the way as close to Little Compton in Rhode Island. So as we are talking about being more environmentally friendly, the reality is, is what I've come to learn, not only just with Franklin, with our state, with our country, we make plans with no thought process of potential ripple effects, and then we're stuck picking up all the pieces. And literally in this particular situation, we are literally picking up the pieces. So knowing that a lot of your 
funds are coming from out of state and 21, 22, 23, moving forward with certain projects and now seeing the projects fail give me great concern for the movement of this green, green energy and some of the integrity of the choices that you also have made. So my question to you is, what are you going to do about the cleanup? Because I guarantee wholeheartedly there will be more issues that come with the wind turbines. Um, also to the marine life, they work off of vibrations. It's how they communicate amongst each other in the ocean. And we're seeing large whales show up upshore, which I guarantee have a lot to do with the vibration that comes off of these wind turbines in the ocean that have dramatic effects. So again, my question is, what are you going to do about cleaning up that mess? And what could the impact be to our wildlife that might be unfixable? Okay. I have another. It's not for you, but it's for her. But go ahead. All right. So first of all, um, the blade that broke on that particular uh, turbine was a result of a manufacturing defect in the factory. So that isolated, they didn't use enough glue to keep that particular blade intact. So the federal government has rules and regulations for what will happen in those circumstances. They shut down the operation completely and are forcing the uh, company, it's GE, has manufactured the blades. And they <coughs> own those blades until the project is turned over to the developer the developers, Vineyard Wind and Avon Bridge. They don't own the blades at this point. It's GE. So GE is taking custody of that blade to determine exactly what happened. And uh, the, the preliminary finding is it wasn't manufactured properly. So the federal government has required them to inspect every single blade on the approximately 25 turbines that are up right now. They will not allow them to turn them back on until all of those blades have been certified that they are intact and do not contain the same manufacturing defect of the blade that fell. In terms of the impact of that blade and the, the debris going, GE owns the pickup and cleanup of all of that debris. They have crews out there every single day doing it. They're even going to retrieve the piece of the blade that's on the ocean floor. They are required to remove that and clean up this. I will say that I've heard it uh, called a catastrophe or a disaster that this blade fell into the ocean. I will suggest to you that it's an inconvenience that that blade fell into the ocean and that debris landed on the beach and that for a day or so, people in Nantucket could not use that beach. That's an inconvenience. What the disaster is are the houses and the lives that are being destroyed by rising sea levels. And uh, just about two weeks ago, a home and beachfront property in Nantucket sold for $200,000. It sold for $200,000 because the owners and the buyers knew that within a year, that wasn't going to be there. That's a disaster. That's a catastrophe. And this uh, movement towards renewable energy is to prevent those types of disasters. With any project, you're going to have uh, glitches along the way. And that blade is a glitch. But Europe has been using offshore wind for over 30 years with great success. The country of England is getting more than 60% of its power from offshore wind. <coughs> we need to transition away from fossil fuels that have created the climate crisis that we're in today. And those are the disasters that we're trying to prevent. I feel terrible that a blade fell into the ocean, but I don't view it as a disaster, and I do not view it as a reason to stop moving in this particular direction, because Massachusetts waters have the most robust wind 
in the entire contiguous United States. Currently, we import natural gas uh, from other states, mostly from Pennsylvania. We have to rely on the transport of that energy through pipelines. And we are subject to international affairs if something goes wrong and we can't get that natural gas or the natural gas spikes. Offshore wind offers us an opportunity to have energy independence and not have to rely on imports from other states. We're going to produce our own energy. When all of these wind farms are up and running, we'll have enough power for every home and business in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. That's an amazing goal to have. And that is also revitalizing communities. Can tomorrow, you? tomorrow, we are going to be holding a press event in Salem mm -hmm. that's going to transform the port of Salem and transform that community. Right now, uh, that port in Salem was the home of uh, one of the last coal-fired plants in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. That coal-fired plant would dis deposit soot and chemicals into the air that made homes dirty, filled lungs, was killing people. That coal-fired plant is gone. It was replaced by a natural gas plant, which has a lifespan of 50 years. That plant will be decommissioned in 2050, just as this transition uh, to offshore wind will have uh, kicked into place. So it is such a promise for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the fact that companies are uh, making donations to me, uh, they see me as someone who understands the issues, and they want to see me stay in Massachusetts because of the vision that we have to transform our energy production in this commonwealth and to uh, defeat the climate crisis, which is here. It's real. It is killing people. And we cannot turn over a society to the next generation. I have children. I hope to have grandchildren someday. And it's my responsibility as a legislator and a leader in the climate crisis to turn over a world where they can breathe freely, where they can go out of their houses without burning, without getting their feet burned from pavement, temperatures that can reach 120 degrees. We need this. And uh, I'm committed to this. Uh, and I will continue down this path because I think it is an amazing opportunity for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Can you guarantee that these offshore winds have no impact to marine biolife? Uh, uh, I'm glad you uh, brought that up. The federal government actually did a study which debunked the myth that it was destroying. Uh, was that just one study? Uh, th no, there are multiple studies because the same studies were required when uh, Europe and England were, were doing uh, offshore wind. We require, as part of the offshore wind package, that there be environmental studies frequently, that there be uh, working groups to study the environmental impacts of these and to take steps to uh, eliminate or uh, um, prohibit any disturbance of marine life. I want you to keep in mind that these turbines are a nautical mile away from one another. And they're 20 miles out in the, in the middle of the ocean. And uh, the impact on marine life has been minimal. I would actually say it encourages some marine life because they built coral reefs around the structures in the bottom of the ocean. So it has actually brought uh, more life. If you'd like to see that study. I would. Know, I would very I much so like to see the studies. Give me your email address. Absolutely. Okay. More than happy. Usually when I email you, you don't get back to me. So I look forward to emailing you. Um, Senator becker Rausch, I have a question directly for you. Regarding the Parental Equality Act, I think it was H.4750, you specifically had mentioned regarding the birth certificates. Wonderful that you're able to support single women and be mindful of them. I, I think that bill had wonderful, beautiful things wrapped into it. However, in the justification of equality, you also managed to remove mother and father um, from the terminology. Can you please speak to that?
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Happy to address the question. Um, that's not true <laughs> that, uh, that the words mother and father have been erased. As far as I know, my kids are still calling me mommy. Um, right, they are, but I'm talking about the birth certificate specific level that you implemented that changed the words instead of saying mother and father. I think it now says parent something and parent one or parent two. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Chair. Give her a chance to mm -hmm. answer the question. Parents go by all sorts of names. We don't actually need to specify in statutory law <laughs> whether a particular parent is a mother or a father. Maybe you have two moms. Maybe you have two dads. Maybe you have only one parent, and uh, and that parent doesn't go by mom or dad. Uh, you know, there are all sorts of different names that people use now. Um, and who am I to say, as a lawmaker? what those names should be. Those names are, you know, and those uh, special words that we use between parents and kids. That's up to each family, I think, to, discern, to determine. And parent is the easiest word that doesn't dictate any of those special, special terms that we use for each other. Um, you know, my, my kids call my mother or grandmother Minna. I've never heard anybody else use that name, but my oldest was trying to say grandma and it came out Minna and it stuck. And so, you know, I don't have any, uh, I have no input as to what particular families are using to, to you know, for kids to, to refer to their parents. I just wanna make sure the forms actually reflect and uplift all the different families we have in the state. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So just to re-ask the question, on the way that the bill is written, does it say on birth certificates now, mother or father, if that was the parent's choice? That'll be up to the Department of Public Health to implement. Thank you. Ken, uh, name and address, please. Uh, Ken Ojuku, 73 South Street, Franklin. Of course, Franklin. Um, <laughs> So a couple of things. I, first, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you. Appreciate uh, all of the uh, work that you've done and, and all of the detail you've provided in terms of just the support this, that, that uh, you've been helping to bring to this community. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the first part. Second part, I just wanted to follow up on a question that uh, Chairman Mercer had, so through you, if, if you would. Um, he asked about uh, the, the risk of losing the, cha the uh, Chapter 7, the Hold Harmless Funding, right? Um, and you, as you said, uh, Mr. Roy, while you're, while you're around, you never, it's never going to go away. I appreciate that. My question, my concern is, I, I never thought it was going to go away, but what about decreasing? What about if they look at the formula? You know, what's the risk of that uh, truly impacting what, what we have, what we're getting today? Does that make sense? Sure, and, and I haven't seen the latest analysis, but the school committee usually does a presentation of the amount of money that the whole house provides, uh, and it's in the several millions of dollars that it would re the resulting impact would be. Franklin's not alone in that, mm -hmm. so uh, there would be an army of legislators that are out there uh, <laughs> saying, no, you can't get rid of the whole house. Piece. So I wouldn't be standing there alone at the, uh, at the schoolhouse. I'll be with my you, hand Jeff. Up. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I meant that rhetorically. Of course. Um, because it, it's a huge issue for many communities in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the Hold Harmless was there to allow us to make some changes to the formula to make it more equitable, but also to acknowledge that we didn't want to cripple communities who had benefited from it. If I could follow that up, I, I, you know, I, I hear all of that, and I and that makes sense. That my concern is more that with a formula change, as, at least as I understand it, Franklin receives, as you said, more than its fair share, you know, historically, and is one of the the larger receivers in the state. So, it, with a change in the formula, there's the risk that some of what Franklin currently gets is going to go elsewhere because they may need more. That's, that's really my, you know, the, the concern that I can see yeah, is that, that an adjustment. That would only come up if we were talking about uh, reforming the formula. If changing the formula. Okay. So that's a debate that I think is not going to come back anytime soon. It's good to hear. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ken. <clears throat> is there anyone else uh, in the council chambers? 
Anyone else out in Zoom land? One. One. I guess we have yeah, one. Uh, Megan Benson. Yeah, we can hear you, Megan. Hi, Megan. Great. Thank you. Uh, Megan Benson, 19 with our drive. So I do have a, a few questions about the current migrant situation. Um, Representative Roy, as you might recall, I did email you three weeks ago asking these questions. Um, but I did hear yesterday that you're still working on getting these answers. So Senator Roush, I'm wondering if you happen to know. Um, I, I do I'll outline these uh, questions and then perhaps you, you're able to answer. Um, the first one, does the latest five, stay, five day stay limit for certain shelters apply to the Old Best Western and Franklin? I'm assuming it doesn't, but want to confirm. Uh, second, do you know if the current contract between the state and the Franklin shelter that was slated to expire on June 30th has officially uh, been extended? And if so, is there a new contract like ND? Um, third, have the folks who have been staying at the shelter in Franklin been granted a new nine month occupancy or would a previous nine month stay apply and those folks would now have to apply for one of the 90 day extensions? Um, and then finally, this is just a new question um, for you, Senator Rouse, just based on your most recent comment tonight um, about medical call calls to these shelters. Um, I Do you know specifically that it has not cost Franklin anything above and beyond um, for calls to the shelter? Or were you speaking kind of as a whole like a statement um, for, you know, towns in general uh, that have these shelters? Well, let me save uh, Senator Rausch on the questions because she probably never heard them before tonight. Uh, and I was keeping track. I was keeping track. Go ahead. Yeah, but as, <laughs> as luck would have it for you, Megan, the answers came in from the administration at 2.11 p.m. Uh, this afternoon. Um, oh, great. And the secret for us sometimes getting answers when the administration is not uh, terribly forthright for us is uh, to CC the uh, representative or senator on the email, and they tend to get back a little quicker. So uh, we did follow up yesterday and uh, got, this is the information on question number one, the five day limit only applies to families in pre-shelter sites, not long-term shelter sites like Franklin. Question number two, the contract has been extended by one year. New contract dates are July 1st, 2024 to June 30, 2025. And your third question was, nine month stay, uh, length of stay requirements are retroactive, meaning that each family's length of stay began when they entered the emergency shelter. Families are notified 90 days prior to their nine month limit and have the opportunity to apply for an extension up to a 15 month total stay. Per the statutory language, only 150 families can be noticed each month. And there's a link for you to get more details on this and you'll be getting this email from our, uh, our folks uh, tomorrow. But uh, since you were on tonight and I had these answers here, wanted to uh, share them with you. Terrific. Okay. I'll follow up as to the ambulance costs. I, I would actually defer to the members of the council um, as to whether there have been any particular you know, increase in, in ambulance or, or 911 costs um, with regard to this particular site. Across the state, generally, the, the usage um, has been extremely low based on the information I've received from the administration, um, and the administration is implementing the, the EA system. Okay, uh, thank you both. I appreciate that. Um, Rep. Roy, just to uh, kind of circle back, I obviously was just listening. Um, I'm, I'm not reading what you had said, and I, I kind of interpret things better once I'm reading it. But that third point there, um, wondering about folks who have been staying in this um, shelter. A lot of them have been here in Molden School, things like that. So would that extension, would they be applying for an extension 
now? Or is that, you know, how would that work? They, they I, I'm trying to think of, um, in terms of the school enrollment, new population that might be coming into the shelter, how will that affect, um, you know, those being displaced? Will that flow on local resources in terms of, um, you know, other, you know, nonprofits that have been helping out, chipping in, just if you have an idea of what that situation might look like. They can apply for an extension after 90 days, up to 150 days stay, and their stay began, it's retroactive to when they first moved in there. So some of them could be uh, subject to getting out uh, right now because the center's been open uh, since I believe August of uh, right. 2023. So um, I, I'm gonna send you that email with those answers just as okay. I laid out so you'll have an opportunity to read it and uh, feel free to reach back out and, and know that uh, you know we're not the legislature is not administering this program. We're putting uh, goalposts uh, on the program and uh, requesting information from the governor's office. But uh, uh, it's it's difficult getting that information out, uh, and they give us more general uh, information, and we have to keep uh, probing to get it. Uh, if you read. I think it's today's Globe had a whole story on uh, how difficult yeah. it is to get that information. But we push, yeah. and eventually we get it. Okay, and I do, yeah, I mean, I think that the general concern is that no one seems to have information, right? The information doesn't get um, pushed down to the local level. It doesn't come, you know, from state senators, state reps necessarily. So it's kind of like if these stay limits are expired, if these people are being pushed out of the shelters, where would they go? What help is needed? What you know, community uh, resources uh, kind of need to be kicked into gear? Things like that. So that's I think um, you know any information that either of you have about this situation. It's obviously very dynamic. It's constantly evolving, I understand that. I think I, everybody understands it's hard to get information, but it's a community that is impacted by this no matter what, you know, no matter what anybody wants to say, there are impacts. Um, and I think it is really important to be as transparent as possible. There's, there are other state reps that I think we've seen that transparency, that communication, the constant kind of this is what's going on, this is what we're working on, these are the questions we're asking. Um, so I, I just personally think that is uh, really important and would be very helpful. I will tell you that I have taken the approach, um, I don't, I've seen other reps uh, who have been very public on this and mm -hmm. it has invited hate speech. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I would not post anything on this topic on social media because it would bring out the trolls and uh, the venom that I've seen in some of these uh, sites where some reps have attempted to do it. I said, I'm not going to do that. Uh, and it invites these uh, protesters to come into the community. Franklin has taken on this uh, migrant crisis uh, in, in, a, in an absolutely amazing manner. Uh, the town leadership, has stepped up to the pl to plate to make sure that these folks had what they needed. Uh, keep in mind that these people are coming from countries in horrendous conditions and they're just looking for a way to get back on their feet. And the way this community has embraced this group of people has made, it made me so proud to be a representative. And I did not want to provide a forum for any type of ugliness in the face of a crisis uh, that we have never seen before in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And, and uh, I keep in very close contact with Jamie on this issue. Uh, we talk about it frequently. If there's a problem, uh, and I know that he had a problem getting some information uh, a few weeks ago, I hopped on it. He got the information right away, and everybody uh, is 
is proceeding uh, very well. And uh, you know, I know the Safe Coalition stepped up, yeah. got in there very early, proud of that group, proud of what they did, the church groups who have gotten involved. Um, you know, this is uh, a crisis that we haven't seen, and uh, this community ought to be proud uh, of the way it has handled uh, this issue. And uh, I'll leave it at that. But, and I do, I do think that that is, I understand what you're saying, and I think it's very important to kind of strike that balance, right, between creating an atmosphere for people to, you know, maybe social media is not the proper place, but also there is something to be said about informing constituents. When it is your town, this is what's going on, this shelter is right here, people live right next door, there's daycares right there. Um, I, I do think there is certainly in, um, you know, kind of a, a need to be communicative about it. And even if it wasn't social media, but perhaps your, you know, newsletter about what's happening in the district, something like that, uh, to inform folks just about, you know, exactly what the situation is looking like, even if it's high level. Uh, some type of communication would be helpful. I, uh, the balance I have struck is to respond to folks who have reached out to me. And I will share with you that only a handful of people have reached out to me with questions uh, calling into question what is happening here. Most of the inquiries I have had have been, what can I do to help? How can I get over there? Where can I send money? Where can I send uh, goods? And I've directed people. Uh, in those directions, um, but I do not want to uh, go beyond having private communications uh, on this particular topic because okay. I think it. I uh, think that you know. does kind of fuel the fire of having these other separate conversations about speculation and what is going on there. So that's why I think it could be important just to kind of high level communication, showing that you have your, you know. Have a, an idea of what's going on, uh, but again, I, I think I've. I've yeah, and and, there, and you have the link to the dashboard, which is got, mm -hmm. gives you high level information on a real time basis. Yeah. You got okay. it. I just want to echo these comments from Representative Roy that the administration is the, the entity that is implementing this program. It's not actually ours to run, um, and, and we're, we have provided goal, goal posts, guide posts. Uh, a step down funding approach um, you know we've we've done those pieces that are squarely within the legislative realm um, and within the legislative lane the administration has a number of pieces that are available right on the website that can be looked at anytime any day thank you uh, in closing I just want to say thank you like every other counselor and everybody here this evening thank you so much for being here and thank you for all you do for us yeah. I'm just telling you I, <laughs> we'll take one last question uh, Dan Saunders Dan, are you there? Yeah. Yeah, and this hand is in the sink. Okay. Uh, again, thank you uh, for coming this evening. Thank you for fielding questions from the council. I think it's uh, been certainly very informative for all of us, and I'm sure for the people at home. Uh, one little piece that uh, 
hasn't been mentioned tonight that I think is very important, and that is both of your accessibility mm -hmm. to us. And I thank you for that. I know I can pick up the phone, I can call Jeff's office, I can call Senator Roush's office, and I get responses immediately. And I know that's the same uh, for everyone else sitting here. So uh, we do really do appreciate that accessibility that you've uh, shown for us. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, and appreciate your constant uh, support and collaboration. Yes, pleasure to work with all of you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We are now producing this in collaboration with Franklin TV and Franklin Public Radio. This podcast is my public service effort for Franklin, but we can't do it alone. We can always use your help. How can you help? If you can use the information that you find here, please tell your friends and neighbors. If you don't like something here, please let me know. Through this feedback loop, we can continue to make improvements. And I thank you for listening. For additional information, please visit franklinmatters.org. If you have questions or comments, you can reach me directly at suresteve at gmail.com. The music for the intro and exit was provided by Michael Clark and the group East of Shirley. The piece is titled Ernesto Manana, copyright Michael Clark and Tin Type Tunes in 2008, and used with their permission. I hope you enjoy. By the way, you can also subscribe and listen to Franklin Matters Radio on your favorite podcast app. Search in podcasts for Franklin Matters.